Hello, I'm going to talk to you about history and trends of healthcare, which is chapter one in our book. So I usually like to start out by asking you a question. And my question is, if you had an infected sore and the doctors use leeches to treat that infection, um, do you feel like that's an ancient or modern treatment? Do you think it works? Those would be my questions to you. Um, and to be completely honest, if you answered ancient or modern, you'd be correct either way. So since um, the ancient Egyptians, leeches have been used in medicine to treat a lot of different things. Um, dental problems, skin diseases, infections, fevers, headaches, a, a lot of different um, things going on. Today, uh, leeches are mostly used in like things like plastic surgery. Um, the reason for that is leeches, they actually secrete an anticoagulant. Um, I'm not sure if you know what an anticoagulant is, but what it is is it's something that stops the blood from clotting. So normally when we start to bleed, the blood will clot itself, which will create a scab and will stop the bleeding. But what leeches do is they actually inject something into our blood, which is an anticoagulant, that will stop the blood from clotting. So it will continue to flow out. So a lot of times you think, well, why is this a good thing? But a lot of surgeons use it in reattachment surgeries. So if someone loses an appendage like a finger or a hand, a lot of times doctors can reattach those, but the biggest problem is to get the blood to flow in and out of that appendage. Um, when they do the surgeries, they can usually attach the arteries rather easy, but veins are a little bit more difficult. So the arteries are carrying the blood to that appendage, but what happens if the veins aren't taking that blood back away is it just pools there. So what they can do is they can use leeches to help drain that blood off of the appendage, which will give the veins time to start working again to help carry that blood away on its own. Um, there's another type of ancient medicine that um, was used that we still use today, and it's kind of disgusting. But um, it's maggot therapy. I don't know if you've ever heard of that before, but um, they actually use maggots to treat different types of things. Um, maggots only eat necrotic tissue. Um, necrotic means dead tissue. So they won't eat the healthy tissue. So even back like in the times of the Civil War, um, soldiers would use maggots to clean out festering wounds because they didn't have any other options. So the maggots would eat all that dead necrotic tissue and leave the healthy tissue behind. So it's still being used today. Um, and actually, it's been found to be very helpful in um, things like diabetic ulcers. Diabetic ulcers are very hard to treat. And a lot of times, um, the patients might end an amputation of the limb. But with the maggot therapy, um, the maggots can go in and they can eat that dead tissue and save the healthy tissue. There have been reports of it um, working out very well. So now the FDA actually has rules and regulations on how maggots and leeches are grown, transported, sold, and disposed of after use. They're actually considered a uh, medical device by the FDA now. So my other question to you would be, why is it important to understand the history of healthcare? Well, just think about the things that I just described to you. Those are something that have been around since the beginning of any form of medicine. And we can still use them today. You know, we've really got away from the history of things, the more natural methods. But we're getting to a point now in healthcare where some things aren't working. And if we can go back to the basics, go back to that, you know, first form of treatment, maybe there's alternate methods that we can give our patients to help heal them. So it's important to know the history to find out what worked and what didn't. There's a lot of different treatment methods that are used today that are from ancient times. Um, acupuncture, that was actually developed 4,000 years ago in China. I always ask my students if they've ever had acupuncture and if they like to share stories. I've never personally had it, but I do have a friend that gets it, and, and she swears by it. Um, so, I mean, if something's been around for 4,000 years, that gives it a lot of credit, right? I mean, obviously something works. Uh, craniotomies, 
Those have been around since ancient times. Um, a craniotomy is like where they actually um, drill a hole into the skull or cut a piece of the skull cap out um, to gain access to the tissue in the brain. Those are actually used during um, the Stone Age time to treat headaches. Can you imagine in Stone Age with the tools that they had that they were performing craniotomies? Um, there's actually one of the first um, documented cases of surgery is a craniotomy. They found a skull um, with surgical holes in it with healing, which means that that patient lived past the procedure. So a lot of times craniotomies were used during the Stone Age period to treat headaches. Um, electroshock therapy has also been around since ancient times. And as crazy as it is to think, we still use that today. Um, electroshock therapy can be very, um, it can work really well in pregnant women. I know that sounds terrible when you say it like that, but um, pregnant women, um, if they have severe depression that could cause them to be suicidal, a lot of times either they can't have the medicine or the medicine takes a long time to work or just people in general, you know, it can take a long time for depression medicine to kick in or to find the pill that works best for that patient. Some may and some may not. So electroshock therapy works really well for um, quick treatment where the medicine takes a little bit longer. There's also a lot of herbal medication, a lot of herbs that um, were used both in the past and in medicine found today. And one of those is morphine. So morphine is actually made from the poppy plant and we use it for pain. Um, aspirin is made from willow bark and willow bark is something that a lot of herbalists or natural um, naturalists will still use today for pain management. There's about um, there's plant extracts in about 40% of today's medication that we use. So it's kind of crazy to think that we're still using those things. And a lot of people are reverting back to it. So in ancient times, people believed that illness and disease were caused by evil spirits and demons. They believed that if you got sick, it was a punishment from the gods. So they didn't have doctors, they didn't have hospitals, they didn't have things like that. Religion was what they used in healthcare. So instead of going to the doctor, if you got sick, they would have a religious ceremony to kind of help get rid of those evil spirits and restore your health. So a little bit different than times today. They didn't understand um, the cause of these things. They didn't realize that bacteria and viruses were causing illnesses. They thought it was evil spirits and demons. So think about back in ancient times, um, knowing what I just told you. If you had a stomach ache or chills during those primitive times, would you tell anybody? And then I would ask you why or why not. And the reason behind it I probably wouldn't is because everyone would think you're suffering because you did something wrong or being punished by the gods. So I think a lot of times people might try to hide their illnesses because of that. Um, have you guys ever heard of trepanation? So similar to a craniotomy, but craniotomy is where they're cutting a hole in the skull and removing it. Um, trepanation is where they bore a hole into the skull. So this was used a lot in ancient times for injury, pain. They even used it for seizures and headaches um, or mental disorders. So think about in ancient times, um, what do you think some of the complications for trepanation were? So one of the biggest things would be infection, right? There was an infection control. Um, brain damage, what if they drilled too far? You know, now we have these nice tools that know the difference between bone and tissue and will stop automatically. Um, I can't imagine the tools that they were using in these ancient times. Could be other things like memory loss, death, things like that. But antiseptics weren't discovered yet. Antiseptics weren't discovered until 1865. Um, they were discovered by Joseph Lister. He was the person who discovered antiseptics again in 1865. So, like I said before, trepanation is actually the earliest proven surgical procedure. 
Um, they have those skulls that they felt seen the trepanation wounds that were healing or completely healed um, from over 7,000 years ago. It's really hard to even fathom. 7,000 years ago, they were boring holes in people's skulls with primitive tools, and, and these patients were surviving. Ancient Egyptians were actually the first um, group of people to record health records. Most of them are recorded on stone, and they were created by the priests who acted as physicians. Because again, there wasn't doctors then. Remember, they were still calling on the gods to heal these diseases because they didn't realize what was causing it. So knowledge was very limited. Um, most people in that time couldn't read, so it had to be kind of passed on to gain that knowledge. And the average lifespan of individuals was only about 20 to 30 years. So think about that in relation to how old you are. A lot of times we think about ancient times and we realize, you know, people are getting married at like 12, 14, 15 years, years old, and we think that's crazy. But if the average lifespan is only 20 to 30 years old, people had to get married that young. Um, the Chinese believed in the need to cure the spirit and nourish the entire body. So this still kind of is something that we hold important today. So the Chinese have always been well ahead of the rest of civilization when it comes to medicine. Um, the holistic methods that they use to treat the entire body, mind, they do the mind, body, and soul. So they like to use herbal medicine, acupuncture, and massage, which are three things that are still very important in today's modern medicine. Um, even with all that, the average lifespan was still only 20 to 30 years. They couldn't cure common colds or um, infections and things like that. They didn't have things that were necessary at that time. Um, we talked about this a little bit, or I mentioned it earlier, but do you think acupuncture works? Why or why not? Um, my thing I'll always say to people is, does acupuncture work 100%? Who knows? But it is used still, and it's been around for 4,000 years, which speaks volumes um, for its potential. I do know that um, hospitals use it. Um, when I worked at a hospital, they used to use it in the behavioral health unit um, to help relieve stress and relaxation. So there's different methods. I mean, is it going to cure cancer? Probably not. But the way I always say things like this is with alternative medicine is, I don't know if it's actually working or if it's a mental response from the patient, but either way, if the patient feels better, isn't that a good thing? Um, also, staying in ancient times, the ancient Greeks um, were very vital in the foundation of modern medicine. Um, their beliefs are actually still held today in Western culture. They stressed diet and cleanliness to prevent disease. This was the first time when anybody said, oh, maybe these diseases aren't caused by evil spirits or the gods. Um, and the person who really started to push that was Hi Hippocrates. Um, he was an ancient Greek, and they named him the father of medicine. Um, and he's kind of still important today. When doctors graduate from med school, they always take the Hippocratic Oath. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Um, the Hippocratic Oath was actually originally wrote by Hippocrates. And what it did was list some very important values for physicians to practice. Um, things like, we will do no harm. There's a lot of other things in there. And there's a variation of it that's still used today. Obviously, they're not using the original text, but they changed it a little bit to fit today's modern medicine. But like I said, Hippocrates is known as the father of medicine, and he was the first one to help establish that these diseases were caused by natural things, not spirits and demons. He started to realize that we needed to have a good diet. Um, we needed to be clean and have fresh air, that that was going to help us prevent illness and diseases. So if someone asked you why the Greeks were the founders of modern medicine, you could answer them in saying that they were the first people to establish that diseases and illnesses were not caused by gods, um, that they actually decided and realized that there was illnesses out there that were caused by other things and that fresh air, cleanliness, and good diet is going to help these people stay healthy. 
Um, in history, a lot of times you learn about the Romans and how they are known for building roads and buildings, um, and then how they fight their wars. A lot of times I will ask how these relate to modern medicine and how they contributed. So there's some important things that the Romans did to contribute to that medicine. The Romans were builders. They built things. Um, they were the first civilization to build sanitation systems to get the sewer waste out of the city. So before that, imagine, you know, there wasn't a way to get that waste from um, going to the bathroom out of the city. People dumped it in the streets. There was filth and contamination everywhere. People were walking through the streets, um, walking through fecal material, walking through urine. So disease was easily transferred. But the Romans built these sanitation systems that would take that sewage waste out of the city. And then another thing that they did was they also built aqueducts that would bring clean water into the cities. So people weren't drinking contaminated water. Um, they also had a large number of soldiers, and their soldiers were very important to them. So um, they developed some of the first hospitals to help treat their soldiers. They also realized that the swamps um, and marshes were causing an increase of malaria. Do you guys know what um, causes malaria? So mosquitoes are actually what carry malaria. So by draining the swamps and marshes that were near the cities and where people lived, they realized that it would reduce the malaria because the mosquitoes wouldn't be around as much. So they really brought a lot of contributions to medicine. There's many changes that occurred in healthcare during ancient times, but treatment was still limited. They started to realize things, but they still didn't have the treatment to help these individuals or patients. The average person had really poor hygiene, you know. Think about the fact that you don't have running water. Um, they lived in unsanitary conditions. And a lot of these diseases hadn't been discovered, and many of the illnesses were very fatal. So the average lifespan has increased a little bit um, to, from 20 to 35 years, but it's still really low in, compar in comparison to now. The Dark Ages um, happened after the fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, the Romans were big on medicine, and after they kind of fell, the study of medicine just completely stopped. Um, and individuals, again, started living in unsanitary conditions. They didn't have personal hygiene. There was huge epidemics of smallpox, diphtheria, tuberculosis, um, typhoid, malaria, the plague. All kinds of different things were running rampant. Um, and they didn't have a way to treat them, and they didn't know what was causing them. And then again, they kind of reverted back to those monks and priests dressing prayer. Um, they weren't trying to treat anything. So the Dark Ages were referred to as such because religion prevented the advancement of science. They were creating a lack of progress of civilization. And then also things like dissection weren't allowed. The, med the study of medicine just completely stopped. So imagine today, even like as you've grown up, if you didn't pay too much attention to medicine, you still had a pretty basic knowledge, right? You knew where your heart was, you know where your stomach is, you know where your kidneys are, I mean, things like that. In the Dark Ages in that early time, before dissection was allowed, people didn't know where the anatomy was inside. Um, so... You know, it's it's really um, a big downfall to modern medicine is not being able to create dissection. They could do it on animals and things like that, um, but it's still not the same. You know, the human anatomy is a little bit different. I already answered that question, so I'm going to skip that slide. Sometimes I get ahead of myself, sorry. So the Middle Ages, there became a renewed interest in the medical practice of the Greeks and Romans. Um, they found some of their writings from the monks did, they, and then they translated those from the Greek and Roman physicians. And they actually recorded that knowledge in handwritten books. So this was the first time that they had like a form of a book with things written down, knowledge from the Greek and Roman physicians that they could pass on to other people. So um, that was huge. 
they were finally going to have that knowledge and be able to pass it on to other people. And then around the 9th century, medical university universities were created to actually train physicians. So we're moving on instead of just having priests that are praying for patients. We're actually training physicians based on the knowledge that we have to help treat people. In the 1300s, an epidemic known as the bubonic plague killed nearly 75% of the population of Europe and Asia. Do you guys know what caused the bubonic plague? A lot of people are going to say rats, and that is true in a sense, but it's actually the fleas on the rats that were causing the bubonic plague. So 75% of the population of Europe and Asia were killed from fleas. That's crazy to think. There was a lot of other things that were causing deaths on top of that. Um, smallpox still, diphtheria, tuberculosis, typhoid fever, and malaria. Those were also killing a lot of other people. So the average lifespan was only about 20 to 35 years still. The Renaissance period is um, referred to kind of as the rebirth of the science of medicine. Um, and um, the reason for that is we got this new source of information. Um, human dissection was allowed. So for the first time, we could view body organs. So this gave us a new source of information that we previously didn't have. So now physicians were able to see how the body worked. And once they could see how it worked, they could try to figure out what was causing illnesses and diseases and then how to fix that. A big part of the human dissection and the knowledge was based on artists like Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. They actually drew the body pretty accurately so people could have those drawings to reference even if they could not perform dissection themselves. These are some of the um, drawings from Leonardo da Vinci. He actually took a, a very um, very big interest in drawing. He actually had um, an individual that donated his body to him. And he spent a lot of time with that individual drawing um, different anatomy. And if you look at these drawings, I mean, they are absolutely amazing. Um, think about that. I mean, we didn't even know how many ribs a person had before, how many vertebrae, where they attached, things like that. But now with these drawings, I mean, these are very um, articulate, very... Um, detailed drawings that show us where the muscle attachment is. This helped physicians immensely. You know, here we've got where all the different anatomy is in the stomach and the kidneys and the heart and where everything's kind of connecting. The heart itself, um, how it worked, how it was pumping. He actually spent a lot of time with the heart. He was very fascinated with that and how it worked in the different chambers. So also in the Renaissance period, the printing press was developed. So that allowed publication of medical books. For the first time, instead of handwriting a book, they could print these books and kind of mass produce them and get them out. So the knowledge was starting to spread and physicians were more educated than ever. Um, so the lifespan was longer. It was about 30 to 40 years, but there was still... Um, that lack of knowledge. They didn't know what was causing the diseases. It was still a mystery. So common infections were still killing a lot of people. In the 16th, 17th, and 18th century, the knowledge of the human body greatly increased. Um, there were some things that really helped that advancement. One was the invention of the microscope by Anton van Leeuwenhoek. Um, he invented a microscope. He wasn't the first one to completely invent a microscope. But um, he invented a microscope that could see a hundred times the human eye. So now we could start to see these organisms that we couldn't see before. So they were starting to understand what was causing disease. It's these little organisms. Apothecaries, um, they made and sold prescribed medication. So apothecaries are herbalists. They were kind of like little pharmacies back in the day. Um, a lot of these medications were made by plants or herbs, and similar to those used in ancient times, and some that are still used today. The first vaccine was ever discovered. It, um, it was discovered by Edward Jenner. 
1796. It was the smallpox vaccine. I don't know if you guys have ever heard the story about how it was discovered, but I think it's kind of cool. So um, smallpox um, was running rampant, and Edward Jenner realized that these milkmaids were not getting smallpox. Milkmaids are exactly what they sound like. They were maids that would milk the cows. Um, and what he kind of put together was cows carry um, a disease called cowpox. So what he was thinking is that these milkmaids weren't getting smallpox because they were um, exposed to cowpox. So while he was a medical student, what he did was he took um, fluid from a cowpox blister and he took that and he scraped, scratched the skin of an eight-year-old boy with that fluid from the cowpox blister. And that was how the first vaccine was invented, just simply by scraping the skin of an eight-year-old boy. I always ask myself, where did this eight-year-old boy come from? Did his parents consent? Was he an orphan that they just were allowed to do whatever they wanted with? But regardless of all that, Edward Jenner invented the smallpox vaccine in 1796. But again, a lot of the causes of other diseases were still unknown. But as you can see, the lifespan is greatly increasing. Moving on from, you know, we know there's diseases, we know there's illnesses, we know that we can try to figure out a way to treat them versus their punishments from God. Um, learning that we need to be clean, that we need to drink clean water, we need to properly dispose of our waste. Those are all things that have greatly contributed to that increased lifespan. The 19th century is a period that we call the Industrial Re Revolution. Um, there was major, major advancements in science due to development of different machines and um, ready access to books. Those were huge. Those gave us great advancements. Um, and also another invention that's very important to us as medical professionals is the invention of the stethoscope. René Lenec, and um, also René is a man. A lot of people in today's time see René and they think that that is a woman, but René was a man that invented the stethoscope. And this was the first time that physicians were able to listen to our internal body sounds. Um, really, his first initial inventions of the stethoscope were pretty primitive. He took um, kind of not cardboard, not paper, but something in between and rolled it up um, and would listen that way. So it was a pretty basic invention, but it worked. Even if you took a piece of paper and rolled it up into a cone shape and put it up to your ear, it definitely increases the sounds. So he did a lot of studies um, with tuberculosis um, and also, um, he was big on um, stenosis of the liver. Those were two things that he really studied. But he actually died from tuberculosis because he had done so much um, with the patients and didn't realize it was contagious. So he actually um, got uh, tuberculosis and died. In the 19th century, um, nursing programs were developed. Florence Nightingale, she established sanitary nursing conditions for the uh, soldiers, which was huge. Prior to that, they didn't even think about having sanitary conditions. They just treated the patients, and a lot of them got infections and died. But she was the first one that said, no, we need to make sure that things are clean um, to help the risk of infection. And she's also known as the founder of modern nursing women became active participants in medical care in the 19th century. Previous to that, they weren't really allowed. Another important individual um, from this time is uh, Clara Barton. Clara Barton was actually the founder of the American Red Cross in 1881. So she was very instrumental in this time period as well. So in the 19th century, infection control was a major development. What is infection control? When you think about infection control, what do you think about? And have you practiced any today? So basically, infection control is just a method to control or eliminate microorganisms, the things that can cause um, disease and illness. So one of the major forms of infection control that you should be doing on a daily basis is hand washing. Um, other forms of infection control are cleaning and disinfectants, and in hospitals, um, standard precautions like PPEs. PPEs are considered um, personal protective equipment. Those are things that we use on a daily basis like 
um, gloves, gowns, masks, things like that that can help prevent the disease. So in the 20th century, this is the period that shows the most growth in healthcare and medicine. So there's a lot of development of different things. Um, X-rays, uh, X-ray machines were developed in 1895 by Wilhelm Röntgen. Um, and medicine such as antibiotics, vaccines to help prevent disease were developed. Um, so those were huge. Antibiotics were probably the biggest thing. I mean, before that, if you got an infection um, or bacterial infection, they might not be able to treat it. But now with antibiotics, um, that was a big thing in medicine where we could actually help people. Another big thing was the causes of many diseases were identified finally. So prior to this, they didn't know what was causing them, and now they do know. So now that they know, doctors are able to treat the cause of the disease to help cure the patient. Um, there's other, some other really important discoveries of new medicine in the 20th century that were really important. Um, insulin was found in 1922, so that was huge in helping patients with diabetes. The antibiotics, and then there was other <clears throat> vaccines such as TB, diphtheria, and the polio vaccine that were developed. There was also a major um, understanding of the human body. So Francis Crick and James Watson, they started to really research DNA. So they started to describe the structure of DNA and did a lot of research in gene therapy starting in about 1950, and that's still ongoing today. What we're learning about DNA is still new every day. Um, and also in the 20th century, they started health care plans. So their help, that helped pay the cost of health care. Prior to that, there wasn't health care. You either paid out of pocket or depending on their situation, you traded um, for goods to get the treatment of medicine. The first open heart surgery was also in the 1950s. And then computer technology was also helping us progress medicine uh, at a very fast rate. And look at the lifespan now. So we went from 20 to 30 years. Now we're at 60 to 80 years. That's a huge leap in the lifespan of patients. I kind of already asked this a little bit and talked about it, but what, what were the 20th century discoveries of new medicine that I think are most important? And I listed some like insulin and antibiotics and vaccines. I think they're all very important. Um, I would probably say the single most important, if I had to choose one, would be antibiotics. That's something that's helped us um, save many, many lives. The 21st century, um, the Human Genome Project is providing a lot of research that's currently going on with genetics today. Um, there was embryonic cell, stem cell research and cloned cell research. There's the threat of bioterrorism using biological agents as weapons. There's viruses that can cause pandemics. I've taught this class for many, many years, and I've always talked about pandemics, and I've never had to live through one myself. Um, so now's the one of the first times where we can actually talk about and understand living through a pandemic now that we've lived through COVID. Um, and, and everything that we've gone through is serious and scary. But when we think back to when I was talking about that bubonic plague that killed 75% of the population and how these advancements in medicine today are really helping us um, fight this pandemic now. There's a huge potential in medicine now. With all the technology that we have, um, advancements in healthcare are unlimited. I mean, really, we're really working hard to try to find um, all kinds of different things. Um, there's a lot of other technology that's influenced healthcare in the 21st century. Things like 3D printing. You know, we're able to 3D print tons of different things. I mean, reattachment limbs, they've 3D printed ears. They can 3D print bone structure. So if someone has a serious car accident and their facial bones have been completely fractured and unfixable. They could 3D print a new cheekbone for a patient. Um, the, the limits for that are, you know, endless. 
they do prosthetics. Um, actually, Washtenaw College in Ann Arbor, um, a few years ago, there was a big thing where they had printed um, prosthetics for a little kid or a hand that was a little bit movable. So, I mean, th these are things that are actually saving money. I mean, you anybody can go out and buy a 3D printer. So it's actually bringing some of the cost of medicine down in certain areas. Some of the other technology that's influenced healthcare is electronic health records. Um, being able to transfer that. So before, if you went to the hospital in, in Jackson here, and then went to the hospital, say, in Ann Arbor, they didn't have your health records. But now, a lot of these electronic records are communicating. So no matter where you're getting care, they're able to pull your records up, which is huge in, in giving you good quality health care. Um, there's also mobile technology, stem cell research, patient portals where you can actually get your information. Um, a lot of different things like that. But with all this technology, there can be ethical issues too, right? Um, we can think about probably a lot of different ethical issues, but some of the biggest ones that come to my mind are um, genetic mutations. Um, parents can pick certain genes for their children. Um, they can decide you know, what things they want to get rid of and what things they want to keep. Imagine if parents can decide, I want, you know, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed baby that can run fast and jump high. I mean, these are things that are possible. Is that right? You know, should we be allowed to do that? Probably not. But what about, say, I want to make sure that my baby doesn't have cystic fibrosis. Can I get rid of the gene for that? Is that acceptable? You know, there's a lot of different things when we talk about that, that where does that ethical line begin and end? Should we allow cloning? What do you think about that? I mean, there's a lot of things when we really break it down. Um, you know, what should be allowed? Um, euthanasia is another one. Abortion. Hacking medical devices. That's a weird, crazy thing. Like, why would anybody want to do that? But it's possible. Um, they can hack into people's pacemakers. You could have healthy people that want to switch out to new technology, like different limbs to help them run faster. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things. DNA reconstruction. So it's hard to know what's right or wrong. I always ask students, what do you feel is the greatest need for our future discoveries? If you could pick one thing to discover, what would it be? And, uh, you know, a lot of the answers are the same. The main one is usually a cure for cancer, and I am 100% on board for that. Um, a cure for diabetes and AIDS. Um, right now, a cure for COVID, right? So, I mean, there's a lot of different things out there that we have a need for still. I don't think that need for um, discoveries is ever going to go away. So kind of moving out of health, out of the history of healthcare and the trends in healthcare today. So there's different trends and one of them we call cost containment. And that's huge. Cost containment is just like it sounds. We're trying to control the rising cost of healthcare. Um, and still give the best possible care or get the maximum benefit for every dollar that we're spending. So if you look at the cost of healthcare, it is exponential. I mean, the costs are rising and increasing all the time. You know, if you've ever gone to the doctor and got a bill, you realize healthcare is expensive. And the reason for these increasing costs is a lot of different things. One, um, technological advances. You know, there's things that we're doing that costs more money. Organ transplants have been around for a while. Those have a high cost. But a lot of other things that we're doing um, today, and as techno technology advances, the costs are going to raise. It's, it's going to be an endless thing. The aging population, people are living longer, right? So we went from 20 to 30 years to 60 to 80. And I mean, obviously, we know now it's even longer than that. Um, but that means people are getting more medical care. They're using more medications, which is costing more money. The chronic conditions that they have, 
um, they're being treated, which costs money. There's twice as many hospital admissions. So that's all contributing to that rise in health care costs. And then there's also lawsuits. So people are kind of quick to sue sometimes. So those health lawsuits force these doctors and providers to obtain more expensive medical practice, um, medical malpractice insurance, sorry. Well, when they have to pay for that high-cost malpractice insurance, what do you think they do? They charge more to offset that cost, right? So the more people that sue, the more insurance they need. So then that's distributed out um, through more people as they have to cover that cost somewhere. So the question I ask here is how is the aging population impacting the cost of healthcare today? I kind of already went through that, right? They're living longer than in the past, so that means they require more care. Um, they need more medication. They have chronic conditions that need to be treated. And there's twice as many people in hospital stays and long-term care facilities and assisted living that's causing that rising cost in health care. So to bring that cost down, we need to focus on cost containment. So there's a lot of different methods for that. One of the main methods that we use are called DRGs. Those are diagnostic related groups. So what happens is when there's government insurance, um, that puts a diagnosis into a certain payment group. So back before there were DRGs, the hospitals could charge any amount of money. So if a patient came in with Medicare, um, they could do multiple tests on the patient and charge, you know, $20,000 to Medicare. And they kind of got fed up with that. So Medicare kind of finally said, no, we're not just going to give you an unlimited amount of money to treat this patient. So what they did is they went through and put each diagnosis into a certain group. And that's everything from a splinter to open heart surgery. And what they did is they associated a cost with that. So they said, okay, for um, pneumonia, we'll pay $1,000. For open heart surgery, we'll pay $100,000. And you have to stay within that limit, or you have to accept the loss. So what that means is, say a patient on a government insurance comes into the ER. Um, whatever they come in for, they're going to be put into that diagnostic-related group. So say it's pneumonia. So they come in, um, and the patient comes in. We don't know that they have pneumonia, right? But they come in, and they have a cough, shortness of breath, um, and that's it, right? So they get in there. So the first patient, patient A, has cough, shortness of breath. They bring them in, and they do a chest x-ray on them, and they see that they have pneumonia. So the DRG is going to pay $1,000 for that. So say the x-ray is $500, and they give them some medicine, which is $100. I'm making all these numbers up, but I'm trying to prove a point. So the total care for that patient was $600. Medicare is going to pay a thousand, so that hospital gets to keep that extra four hundred dollars. So, on the other hand, say you have a patient that comes in, they have a cough, shortness of breath, they do blood work, and they realize the patient might have a blood clot, so they send them over for a CT scan, and they find out that that patient had pneumonia that way. Well, that CT scan's two thousand dollars. The blood work that they did is probably $500. So at this point, we're saying that patient's sitting at about $1,500 in care. Well, the government insurance is only going to pay $1,000 of that. So the hospital went over what's acceptable for that care, and they have to accept the loss of that $500. They can't charge the patient, and the insurance isn't going to pay for it, so they just have to kind of eat that cost. So... The DRGs can be good in certain ways because then hospitals aren't doing unnecessary testing on patients. So that's a good thing for patients and insurance companies alone alike. But what it can also do is something we call stinting care. Stinting care means withholding certain things or not doing proper testing on a patient. So, um, you know, if a hospital doesn't want to do testing because they know that they're not going to get paid for it, that is stinting care. 
and it can cause a lot of issues. What if a patient isn't properly diagnosed because the hospital withheld care because they didn't want to pay for it? So there's good and bad that comes along with the DRGs. So other forms of cost containment are a combination of services. So that's where healthcare agencies kind of band together and they can provide care to a larger number of people at a decreased cost. There's also outpatient services. So if you've ever had outpatient surgery or things like that, they've realized that there's a lot of procedures that can be done where the patients don't need to stay. So that's actually decreasing the need for hospital admissions, which lowers the cost of healthcare prices. Other forms are mass or bulk purchasing. If you work in a facility, especially hospitals, a lot of times they have one um, location, like a um, materials management type that will buy and order supplies in larger quantities for all of the hospital and disperse them, and then they get a reduced rate. Just like you would go to Sam's Club or Costco, you buy in bulk, you get a cheaper rate, right? So it's the same thing for the hospitals. Another form of cost containment, which is actually beneficial to the patients, is early intervention and prevention. So they've started to realize that preventing illnesses or getting them, finding them early and treating them is more cost effective than waiting till that illness or disease is more advanced and they have to do things like surgery and things like that. So um, while their reasoning behind it isn't good, just realizing that it's cheaper to help prevent them um, instead of waiting, it's still better for the patient, right? If we can get early intervention and preventative services, then that's going to help the patient in the long run. So that's why a lot of insurance companies now are paying for um, testing to be done ahead of time um, like mammograms, cervical cancer screenings, things like that, so that we can catch diseases early or even um, prevent them. Energy con conservation is also a cost containment, so monitoring the use of energy to control costs and conserve resources. One of the big ways that they do this is um, in hospitals, like on the weekends. Um, if you ever are there, you'll notice like they usually dim the lights or turn off the lights in certain locations that aren't being used on the weekends. Home health care is another way that's uh, lowered the cost of health care. So this is where the service is actually provided in the patient's home. This kind of grew a lot when the DRGs were first initiated because prior to that, patients could stay in the hospital for any length of time. But with the DRGs, they started to cut that off. And they were like, okay, well, what's the need for this? They don't need to be in the hospital at this high cost. We can get them cheaper care um, in their homes or in a, a long-term facility where it's going to be cheaper than them staying in the hospital. So that kind of trend returned to the home care of the earlier years. It's a lot more expensive to stay in the hospital than it is to provide care in the home or even in a long-term care facility. Geriatric care is, simply put, care for the elderly. So our percentage of elderly population is growing rapidly, and the reason for that is people are living longer, right? So with all these advances in healthcare and medicine, um, patients are living longer lives, which creates this need um, to t take care of the elderly. Baby boomers, that big boom in babies, they, they're, they're in their geriatric age now. So there's a population increase with that age. So that means there's a need for a lot of different types of facilities, and we need more of them. So we need varying levels of care for the geriatric population. Not all of them need total care. So we need assisted living where there's just slight care to um, rehabilitation, to total long-term care where they're given 24 hours care. The OBRA, or the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1987, this was where federal regulations came in for long-term care facilities and home health care. Prior to this, there weren't requirements for training um, for nursing assistants or geriatric assistants. They were just hired. They didn't need to have any training under their belt at all. So in 1987, they passed this act that required um, state training and competency evaluation programs for these nursing and geriatric assistants. Telemedicine is something that's very popular, especially right now. I don't know um, if any of you have 
um, in recent times since the pandemic, since COVID, have had a video um, health visit with your doctor. These were something that were very rare. Um, we used a lot of telemedicine in other ways, but the actually um, having an appointment with your doctor via telemedicine was rare, but now it's something that's quite common. They weren't wanting the patients to come into the office as much, so they realized that they could use video conferencing to have these appointments. I actually just had my first one um, with a follow-up visit with my doctor for an MRI, and it was fine. It was easy. It was, you know, I didn't have to drive into my appointment, which was 45 minutes away, so I actually preferred it. Um, I could see how it could be very frustrating or difficult for the elderly population if they're not tech savvy or don't have computers and things like that. But with telemedicine, they can use video, audio, and computers to help provide medical care. So they can use it to obtain medical records or reports. You can transmit data from one hospital to the other or from an ambulance to a hospital. So that's huge. Prior to a patient coming in, they could call ahead and kind of tell them everything. But if they can actually transmit the data of everything that they've done, the care, their EKG readouts, things like that, to the hospital before the patient ever gets there, it's going to give them a step up on that care. It'll decrease the need for coming into the medical centers. It decreases the need for home health visits. Um, if patients can manually upload some of their... Um, vital signs and things like that, that will decrease the need for a nurse actually having to come out and take the patient's blood pressure and pulse. Telemedicine is going to be huge um, for healthcare delivery in the future. I mean, now that we've realized during this pandemic what we can use it for even more, I think it's going to become more commonplace, especially those virtual doctor's visits. When we talk about wellness, wellness is something that's very important um, to us as individuals. Wellness, simply put, is just a state of optimum health. It's a good balance between physical, social, and mental health. So a lot of times what wellness is, is it's just focusing on the disease prevention, and it helps save costs, right? If we're healthy, we're not going into the doctors. We're not getting medical attention. We're not going into the ERs. So it is still a form of cost containment in a way. So ha using exercise, nutrition, weight control, and healthy living habits can help us reach that optimum state of health. And it's, you know, it's funny, that seems commonplace, it seems like it makes sense, but it hasn't always been known. I mean, if we think back even just a short time, um, my parents, when they were young, and I'm, in my, I'm only 40, my parents didn't realize that smoking was bad for you, or bad for kids. My parents smoked in the car with us with the windows up most of the time because it was cold and they didn't want us to get cold. So they were aware that the cold might affect us, but they didn't think that the smoke would. And it's funny now thinking back, like for all of us, we probably think, how could they not have known that the smoke was bad? But they didn't. And a lot of times it was pushed as, as a, you know, society thing. It was, um, something that was sensationalized, so they didn't know the difference. So, you know, a lot of things for us, we realize, oh, this isn't healthy, but your parents or grandparents might not have realized that. Um, I remember having a conversation with um, an older person in their 60s, not that old, um, that didn't realize, like, um, breads could be bad for you, or like when she was talking about her diet, um, that pop was bad for you or things like that. Like, and this is a very educated person. It was a very educated, educated individual, but they didn't realize like the fried foods and the breads were bad for you when it came to health and weight. Um, and I remember thinking that was very surprising to me. So we can't just take for granted that everybody knows what wellness means and what they should do to obtain that wellness. Um, my dad is diabetic. He has no clue how to control his diabetes. I have said to him many times, Dad, you have to eat every couple hours. You have to eat healthy. You have to stay within a carb limit. These are what you should be eating. And he doesn't, and he doesn't understand why, you know, he needs to do that. So we just need to realize that just because we understand something and it seems simple to us doesn't mean that everybody else is going to have that same understanding. 
So there's a lot of different types of wellness. And, and to reach that total wellness, we need to focus on all of them. So physical wellness, which is diet and exercise, right? Our body's um, wellness. That's important. But also other things are very important. Our emotional wellness is very important. Understanding our own feelings and expressing them appropriately. Sorry about my dog barking there, but if you heard that. So um, emotional wellness, you know, is just our entire emotional well-being being healthy. You know, understanding our feelings, expressing them appropri- appropriately, um, you know, if we're dealing with different things like depression, um, anxiety, those can affect our emotional well-being. Our social wellness is just showing concern and affection and respect for others. We're able to operate in a social environment. Um, mental and intellectual wellness is just being creative, logical, and open-minded. And spiritual wellness is having values, ethics, and morals. So there's a difference between religion and spirituality. Um, someone can be spiritual be- without being religious. Um, there, There is that difference, and I just want to make sure that you're aware of that. So spiritual wellness just means having values, being ethical, and having morals. So it's really important um, to kind of have that whole wellness. A lot of times um, we will focus on holistic health care which will treat the whole mind, body, and spirit. What it does is it looks at each person in a unique way and realizes that they do have different needs. Sometimes with medicine, you know, everybody that has diabetes is going to take this or everybody that has depression, they're going to treat this way. Well, with holistic healthcare, they don't do it that way. They don't put everybody in this box and say, well, this is the medicine for this or this is the treatment for this. They're going to look at you and try to figure out what's going on, what your signs and symptoms are, and, and find different ways to treat that based on what that patient truly needs. So they'll use many different methods to diagnose a patient and to treat them. Their emphasis is going to be on protecting the patient and restoring their wellness. So they'll promote the body's natural healing powers. Instead of just using medicine sometimes, there's a lot of different ways that they can do this. And there's a lot of different holistic health care out there. And it was wildly popular back when there wasn't modern medicine. And then it kind of went away a little bit. But now it, it's making a huge comeback. Um, people are turning back to natural healing and natural health. So as a healthcare worker, you might not understand that. You might not believe in that holistic method or the natural healthcare um, or, you know, like the essential oils that are big right now. Um, you might not believe that, but you need to understand that that's the patient's choice. And as a healthcare worker, it's always going to be our job to respect that patient and their choice, no matter what we believe. So how do you think that Emotional, social, mental, intellectual, or spiritual wellness can impact a person's physical health. When you think about it, you know, when someone has mental health issues, the stress can affect our body, right? If someone has depression, it can make them feel fatigued. It can give them pain. It can cause headaches. So our emotional wellness is very important to our physical wellness, right? Our mental wellness as well. Social isolation can affect a person's mental health, which then can turn into issues with their physical health. Um, You know, someone who's in pain for long periods of time, it can affect their mental health. Have you ever been in pain for a long period of time or known someone that has? It can make them angry. It can make them sad. It can make them feel hopeless. I always share a story about a woman who I've known my entire life. I've always called her like an aunt, but she was just a family friend of my grandparents. The sweetest woman I've ever met. Never heard that woman swear, nothing. One time she came into the hospital I was working at and I looked at her and I said, oh my gosh, hi, it's Stacy, you know, and I was trying to talk to her and she looked at me and she said, I don't give a bleep who you are, bleep. (laughs) And she cussed me up one side and down the other and was screaming at me and, you know, it was, I just stood there in shock because I've known this woman my whole life and I have never heard her speak like that. And I went out to her husband and son and said, you know, what is going on? And they were like, how is she? I'm like, she just cussed me out. And they both looked at me and said, no way. But her pain was so high that it affected who she was and, you know, how she normally reacts. So I try to remind my students that a lot. Um, 
is don't take it personally. When you're working in healthcare, um, you may figurative, figuratively be someone's punching bag. Um, that doesn't make it okay, and we shouldn't ever be treated like that, but just realize a lot of times it is not personal and that person is in pain. And if you've ever hurt yourself and been in a lot of pain, maybe you can slightly understand that. And a lot of times when someone treats us bad, it's it's our initial reaction just to kind of jump back or step back or get angry. And if we can understand that this patient may not behaving be behaving like their normal self, and that we just need to continue to give them good care, Um, it's going to help everybody in the long run. So there's a lot of different um, alternative methods of healthcare out there. So um, there's something called complementary and alternative methods of healthcare, and we call that CAM, CAM therapies, C-A-M for complementary and alternative methods. So complementary therapies, those are used in conjunction with conventional therapies. So they're combined. So conventional means modern medicine, what we use. So that could be if someone has migraines, they may take um, some prescription medication, but maybe they also do acupuncture or aromatherapies or essential oils. So those are used in combination with each other. It could also be things like for back pain. Maybe that person gets steroid injections, but they also use massage as another form of therapy. Alternative means that they're used in place of biomedical therapies. So that would mean like instead of using the pain medication, they get massage. Um, Or instead of like the diabetic treatments of amputation, maybe they do the maggot therapy. Um, So complementary means it complements the conventional medicine. And it's used in conjunction with. Alternative means it's used in place of. So integrative healthcare uses both mainstream and CAN therapies. So examples of that, like chronic pain, is treated with both medication and CAM therapies that can encourage stress reduction. So acupuncture, massage, things like that. And these are becoming a lot more popular you know, 10 years ago, this might not have been as big of a deal, but um, now patients are looking for alternative medicines. They're looking for alternative therapies um, to kind of help them, especially when things aren't working. When medicine itself is not working, people are starting to reach out and try to find other methods to help control what's going on. There's a lot of different types of CAM practitioners out there. There's Ayurvedic, which restores and maintains harmony. Chinese medicine, which focuses on our life energy, which is our chi. There's chiropractors, hypnotists, homeopaths, which they think the body can heal itself, and they'll give certain things that will promote the body to heal. And then naturopaths, which use only natural therapies. This kind of goes back to my thing where I talked about with acupuncture is, you know, does it work? We don't know 100%. You know, do all these different things work? We don't know. But if it helps the patient in any way, shape, or form, then it's not a bad thing, right? As long as it's not interfering with the treatment of the patient, then, you know, why knock it? Um, My uncle was hypnotized to quit smoking mm, probably 20 years ago or longer, actually, geez. Um, And I thought it was crazy. I remember being young and thinking, this is not going to work. And he walked out of there and has never smoked a cigarette since. So the way I look at something like that is, was it mental? Did it really actually work? Well, that's obviously mental, but, um, or is it just something he thought worked so he quit smoking and it gave him that willpower? Either way I look at it, he quit smoking, so it's a win-win, right? So there's a lot of different things like that out there. Um, There's also acupuncture, aromatherapy, Reiki massage. Um, Most of these methods that we're using are non-invasive, non-invasive and holistic, Um, but they often offer a less expensive um, method of treatment. But the difference is, and the problem with some of these therapies is, most of them aren't covered by insurance. So they can be less expensive than 
traditional treatments, but it could cost the patient more out of pocket because the insurance companies don't cover them. Some of them might, but not all of them do. So some doctors aren't going to support um, alternative medicines because there's not a lot of scientific studies that support it or prove that it's actually working or legitimate. So some doctors aren't going to entertain it at all. Others are thinking, you know what? If it helps my patient or makes them feel a little bit better, what's the harm in it? As long as it's not causing any harm to their care or interfering with the treatment from traditional medicine, most doctors are supportive of it. Um, usually at this point, I would ask what your opinions are. Are they positive or negative thoughts to their use? Um, I think each person's going to have different views on it, and that's completely 100% fine. Like I said, you don't have to believe in any of it at all, but... As a healthcare worker, you will always respect your patient's decisions. You can't give them your biased opinion on it. You can't roll your eyes when they say they're using essential oils or um, when they say they, they don't want surgery, they want to try this instead. We need to always 100% respect their opinion. Educate them, give them as much information as you can unbiased, but then realize it's their decision to make and support them for it. So my conclusion for this chapter is something that's very important for you to know going into healthcare is healthcare has changed dramatically since the beginning of time, and it will always continue to change. Healthcare is ever changing, and as a healthcare worker, you'll be learning for the rest of your career. It may not be in-depth. It's not going to be like you're going to college again, but things will change and you will have to learn things. So to be a healthcare worker, you need to be adaptable. You need to be able to change with your career as you go. Um, you have to stay educated. As a healthcare worker, you need to be aware of the changes that are occurring if your facility isn't teaching you those things. So um, most healthcare careers are required to do continuing education. Doesn't mean college classes again. Sometimes it's just reading medical journals and things like that. But you need to make yourself aware of what's going on. And we need to make every attempt to learn about different trends that are out there um, because patients are coming from all walks of life and they're going to want and expect different types of treatments. So make sure that you're open to learning and change and growing as a person and as an individual.